So Eric, welcome to Penn State. It's wonderful to have you here and um, so much looking forward to your talk tomorrow. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure. So um, our center is looking at how we can use online innovations to help improve the learning experience for our students. That's our ultimate goal. And uh, with your background and your research, I know that uh, this is a space that you live in and think about a lot. I'm interested if you might have an idea of, from your experience, what are the inhibitors that you see that students face that, that prevent them from learning a particular content domain? Yeah, especially when they don't want to learn that content, uh, like good point. physics in good my point. case. <laughs> <clears throat> I think there are, there are basically two reasons for that. The first one is that um, I see education as a two-step process. The first step being information transfer. And the second, much more important step is for the students to make sense of that information, to have this aha moment. I get it. I, I, I've internalized it. And I think, unfortunately, most of education, in person, online, focuses exclusively on that first step, on the transfer of information. That's a trivial and a not very exciting mm -hmm. part of, of education. The much more exciting one is there where you get to think, say, oh, I get it now. And the first part is really important. It's very important. We can't do without it. Yeah. However, it is done almost exclusively in the classroom, mm -hmm. leaving that second much harder part to the students on their own. The second mm. reason, I think, why it's so hard is that most students don't take ownership of the learning. They don't learn because they want to learn. They learn because they have to learn. It's a requirement. They're told, you know, take this course or take that course. When you look at long, young children, they don't learn by sitting in a lecture and taking exams and so on. They learn out of curiosity, sure. out of an innate Experience. desire to learn. Yeah. Right? And I, I think that there are ways of rekindling that ownership. Unfortunately, I think focusing on the information transfer is not one of them. Yeah. So um, in, your, in your best case scenario then, would you come up with a, a potential environment where, I don't know, it sounds like maybe it's just flipped? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that that yeah, sort of yeah. started in my classroom 25 years ago. Yeah, so I mean, if we're taking in these two steps, right, information transfer and what I would call assimilation or sense making, um, the first one typically being done in class, the second one, you know, you send off the students to their rooms mm -hmm. to, you know, figure it out on their own. In a sense, you want to invert that or flip that mm -hmm. and give students the responsibility for the information transfer so that they come to class not necessarily knowing it all, that'd be nice, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but at least having primed the pump, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then you use the interaction between the instructor and the students, or the teaching staff and the students, as uh, an opportunity to get these, these aha moments, to get the sense making, to, to do something with that information. My sense is as an instructor, your excitement comes from, I mean, I know that you know your content and that's a good thing and healthy thing, but I bet you get really excited about that application part where you can help them have those aha moments by showing them how the theories and concepts of physics actually apply to real life. Absolutely. It, it, it is just addictive it's <laughs> because, because you get a window into the minds of the students. Mm. By the way, you said show them. I don't show them. I help them discover, mm, good point, right? Good so, so rather than by showing and telling, mm. I essentially teach by questioning. Mm -hmm. So um, I happen to be in a, uh, a session you did a number of years ago where you took an audience of uh, 200 or 300 people in the room and gave us an assignment where we had to do this revelation through a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction, which I, my guess is was one of your techniques, because I know there, there are probably several very, very effective in terms of getting us involved in that, to that issue of ownership. So if you had to, or I should say if you could, design a system that was an ideal learning environment, thinking of this two-phase sequence that you just laid out, what might that look like? So you mentioned what I did a few years ago, which was basically a way of taking a flawed approach to teaching the lecture and making it interactive. Your question is one that I've been thinking about a lot mm -hmm. over the past years. What if rather than 
taking something that doesn't work that well and making it better, we wiped everything off the table and asked ourselves, what would be a, an ideal way of solving this problem? And what I've settled on in these last few years is a, it's certainly a flipped approach, is moving the information transfer out of the classroom. Let's talk about that in just a second. I'm shoving it aside for now. And then in class, in order to both have students make sense of that information, but also take ownership of the learning, I use a combination of team-based and project-based learning. So in a sense, rather than giving my students the book and saying, here, learn this, it's good for you, mm -hmm. I tell my students, we're going to work on some really cool projects, mm -hmm. which are basically motivating by adding an element of empathy or social good. Mm -hmm. And then I tell them, and by the way, you may want to look at this book mm -hmm. in order to do your, your project. So in a sense, the project becomes a Trojan mm -hmm. horse that hides mm -hmm. the, the content. And the second part is the team-based approach, which creates a social responsibility mm. for the learning. In other words, they come to class in order to not let their team down. Mm. They come to class not to please me, mm. but to make sure that the team can do its job. So that's for the in-class mm. part. Now, for the out-of-class part, I, I thought a lot about the information transfer. I mean, one way would be just to videotape me lecturing and mm -hmm. put it online, maybe together with some multiple-choice question. In fact, there's a lot of that is happening. But I noticed from looking at the edX data that the viewing habits online are horrible. Students watch the first few minutes and then they skip. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, students put the playback speed at 1.3, mm -hmm. right? They try to get through this video as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. It's a way of getting through a lecture faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if anything, there is less cognitive engagement than there is even in a, in a physical mm -hmm. classroom. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, the difference between watching video and reading is that with reading, you pace yourself, mm -hmm. right? If you need to think, you stop, mm -hmm. you stop reading. Your, your mind wanders and stop reading. If you're watching a videotape, you could, in principle, stop it, but very few students mm -hmm. do that. So we developed an online tool to engender meaningful reading. And the way we do that is that we put it again in a social context. So students get the document. And, and they annotate it, but they can see each other's annotations. So if a student doesn't understand something, he or she can annotate it and say, I don't understand why, mm. blah, 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 blah. It is social. This is in a social environment. Yes. And so the students basically help each other parse the information. Mm. And we use a combination of statistics and machine learning algorithms to process all of that, both to give feedback to the students on their annotations and also to give feedback to the instructor as to what needs to be done in the classroom. Sure, so sure. it basically primes the pump for both the teacher and the students. So in that environment... Oh, and there's one more yeah, thing. Ahead, please. The other thing is that it prevents all the, the students from just reading the first few pages and then stopping the analog of watching right, the first few minutes right. because we have a distribution requirements of the annotations. Uh. Oh, I see. So if I you put see. them all on the first two pages, sure. they only get pages divided by total pages right. credit. Oh, I see. So in the, when they're annotating it, then, do you, do you allow or enable peer-to-peer? -peer? Can Absolutely. someone come in and say, well, here's what I think this concept means? Absolutely. So that's the, that's the social aspect. Of Absolutely. It. So they see each other's annotations. Okay. So I want to just pick apart real quick that idea of that ownership. Do you find from your experience on these teams that students... Um, begin to own more of their, their learning process because is there an effect of them being in a social group that they own it more than if they were individual? I, th I think most of the ownership comes from the project, which is sort of the Trojan horse yeah. that hides okay. the, the material. I, th I think that is what gives most of the ownership. I also try to appeal to their imagination by putting them on a problem, you know, like improving the environment using static electricity or, mm -hmm. or designing musical instruments for El Sistema in Venezuela or you know, doing things where, where, where they can do something that's good for society. I think that, that sort of fuels their imagination, unleashes their creativity, and, and, and gives them an opportunity to, to own take ownership mm -hmm. of the learning. The team-based part provides a social responsibility for the learning in the sense that 
um, you know, because there's not just a team accountability, there's an individual accountability too, mm -hmm. but because each project is harder than any single individual could possibly do, mm -hmm. if any individual drops out, the rest of the team is not going to be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a sense, they put pressure on each other to perform. Yeah, very interesting. So that's our, that's our end goal. It, what, what can I do as a faculty member to take a step toward an environment that you just described? Well, I mean, there are a lot of factors that come in there, right? I mean, one is the learning space. Most of our learning spaces, I've seen some innovative spaces on campus mm -hmm. here, but I'm sure that most of the spaces here are still the classical amphitheater right, setting. Right. Not geared on uh, interaction at all. You could sit down in an amphitheater, you turn into a passive observer. Right. So I think if you are teaching in that space and you don't have the ability to change the space, mm -hmm. you're limited in what you I can see. do. In that case, what I would suggest is to bring in interactivity mm -hmm. by using something like P-instruction, right. which is what I developed for my courses that were taught in those mm -hmm. spaces, where you teach by questioning rather than telling. Mm -hmm. Ask a question, mm -hmm. have students vote, have them talk to each other trying to convince mm -hmm. Right, right. Each this other teaching one yeah. another, vote again, wrap up, next question, and so on. That, of course, also requires to move the information transfer out of the classroom. Right. And that can be done through online videos, through sure. the system that I just described, sure. through yeah. just-in-time teaching. So I would say that's mm -hmm. perhaps the, the first step. Okay. And then as we redesign our learning spaces, which I, I'm happy to see mm -hmm. is happening sure, on campus sure. here, and re rethink the, the, the environment, essentially, in which students are going to learn, we can think about other approaches like team-based learning, like project-based learning, and so on. But that's a, that's a step out. So I've got to be thinking about shifting to an active learning environment and uh, shifting the way I'm delivering my content before I'm able to move to that second step. I would say so, because that second step requires a much bigger investment in the redesign of, yeah. the, of the space. Terrific. Listen, that was a great response. I really appreciate your time and your thinking. My pleasure. And, and again, welcome to Penn State. It's great to have you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.